Assalamu alaikum. I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak. This is a presentation to embryology of the cardiovascular system. Uh, the embryo till the third uh, week of development, which is the trilaminar germ disc, do not need or does not need the cardiovascular system because in nutrition to this small embryo at the third month is uh, provided by simple diffusion. But later on, embryo more than the third week needs uh, a circulatory system. Therefore, the visceral layer of lateral plate of mesoderm, I think that everybody know that visceral layer. We say that uh, in the general embryology, the mesoderm on the side of the midline is called paraaxial mesoderm. The more lateral to this, the paraxial mesoderm, of course, will form the somites. More lateral to the paraxial mesoderm, it is the intermediate mesoderm that form the kidney system. And further lateral to the intermediate mesoderm, it is the lateral plate of mesoderm. This lateral plate of mesoderm divides by intraembryonic cavity into a layer near the ectoderm, which is called somatic layer of lateral plate of mesoderm and a layer near the endoderm which is called visceral layer of lateral plate of mesoderm and this visceral layer uh, after the third week will form clusters of cells that are called angiogenetic clusters of cells these clusters of cells the angiogenetic cluster of cells will not will form blood cells and will form blood vessels and sh surely the blood cells will be uh, inside the blood vessels. So the first st step in cardiovascular development is formation of angiogenetic cell cluster from this visceral layer of lateral plate of mesoderm that form blood cells inside blood vessels. Regarding the embryology of the blood, the angiogenetic cell cluster, as we said, form blood cells. This earlier form of blood cells are called primitive blood cells. The primitive blood cells then will gradually uh, undergo a programmed cell death. These primitive blood cells will die gradually and replaced gradually by newer blood cells. Newer blood cells are called fetal blood cells. So all the primitive blood cells later on will be replaced by fetal blood cells due to this gradual program cell death of primitive blood cells. The new fetal blood cells will migrate to the hemopoietic system of the fetus, mainly in the liver and bone marrow, even in the spleen. And this hemopoietic system of the uh, fetus will form the definitive final blood cells. This is the embryology of the uh, blood. So, regarding the embryology of the blood vessels, we have to start with embryology of formation and position of the endocardial heart tube. The angiogenetic cell cluster will form, will be formed anterior before being formed posterior. And this is a general rule for all embryonic structures that uh, they develop anterior before and posterior. So the more anterior angiogenetic cell cluster will form blood vessels. These blood vessels will form a horseshoe or U-shaped uh, blood vessels in the anterior part of the uh, germ disc, which is called U-shaped endocardial heart tube and this U-shaped endocardial heart tube is formed around the oropharyngeal membrane which is the book of pharyngeal membrane or even it could be called as the oral plate you know the uh, trilaminar germ disc shows an interior region of fusion between the ectoderm and endoderm with no mesoderm called bucopharyngeal membrane, oropharyngeal membrane, or even oral plate. And you can see that the U shaped or the horseshoe heart tube, endocardial heart tube, is formed around the bucopharyngeal membrane or oral plate. 
The anterior central part of the U, which is this region, is called cardiogenic field. This term, the cardiogenic field, does not mean that this anterior mid-region of the U-shaped heart tube here only will be the heart. The heart will be derived from all this U-shaped heart tube. But the central mid-region of the U is called cardiogenic field because, as you can see in Sagittal section, the intra-embryonic cavity near the cardiogenic field, this intra-embryonic cavity, will be later on the cavity uh, that surrounds the, the heart, which is called pericardial cavity. And that's why this central anterior portion of the U-shaped heart tube is called cardiogenic field. All the U-shaped heart tube will form the heart later on. But the central anterior portion of the U-shaped heart tube is called the cardiogenic field because the intraembryonic cavity near to it later on will be the site of pericardial cavity. And you can see that this anterior region of the U-shaped uh, heart tube lie just anterior to the bucopharyngeal membrane. This is the position of bucopharyngeal membrane, and the U-shaped heart tube is just anterior to it. Or even you can see here, this is the position of the bucopharyngeal membrane, and the center of the U, which is the cardiogenic field, is just anterior to the bucopharyngeal membrane, or called the uh, oral plate. The heart will start beating in the fourth week of development. And this is a figure to chick embryo showing very clearly the U-shaped configuration of the horseshoe-shaped or U-shaped endocardial heart tube. This slide is from, from the laboratory of uh, embryology in College of Medicine and Naharan University. We said that uh, the U-shaped heart tube would be formed in the anterior part of the embryo around the bucopharyngeal membrane. More caudal angiogenetic cell clusters will be derived from the more caudal visceral layer of lateral plate of mesoderm. And therefore, there will be a formation of a bilateral great vessels that are, called, that are called bilateral dorsal aorta on the side of the midline. And these bilateral dorsal aorta will be in continuity with the U of the heart tube anteriorly. What's going on during development? That the embryo will be folded laterally as it is shown in this figure and also the embryo will be folded anteroposteriorly after the fourth week of development or third week probably. And because of this lateral and anterior posterior or called cephalocaudal folding, there will be a changes in the U-shaped heart tube. Let's look to the heart tube in section, which is transverse section, to know what's going on as a result of lateral folding. Because this is a section in the U-shaped heart tube, you can see that the U-shaped heart tube appears here in that and that region because it is a section in the limbs of the U. It is a transverse section in the limbs of the U. So you can see that during lateral folding of the embryo, the limbs of the U approximate each other and then fuse in the midline to form a single heart tube, which is called endocardial heart tube. Also, you can see that the anteroposterior folding also the affect the heart tube. And actually, the anteroposterior folding of the heart tube affects the position of the heart tube. You can see that the cardiogenic field, which is the center, the anterior center of the U, nearing, uh, lying anterior to the bucopharyngeal membrane here, but because of anterior-posterior folding, the cardiogenic field will be changed in position to become ventral to the bucopharyngeal membrane instead of 
the original position, which is anterior to the bucopharyngeal membrane. And more anterior posterior folding result in more deviation of the cardiogenic field caudal to the bucopharyngeal membrane. So in summary, we can say that the lateral folding result in fusion of the limbs of the U-shaped heart tube to form single heart tube, while the anterior posterior folding will deviate the cardiogenic field from a position anterior to the bucopharyngeal to become ventral to this membrane and then caudal to the bucopharyngeal membrane. And of course, during that, that change in position, the heart will change its position in the embryo from the neck down into the thoracic region because it is a descent from the head to the thorax. Here also you can see that the single heart tube formed by lateral folding of the embryo. This single heart tube will be formed of three layers. The lining epithelium is the endocardial heart tube and to outside of this epithelium or endothelium there will be a gelatinous substance called cardiac jelly and of course this cardiac jelly is transient it will disappear later on and outer to the cardiac jelly is a layer which is called epimyocardium outer so out to outside of the jelly this outer epimyocardium sometimes is called epimyocardial mantle will form the muscle of the heart which is called myocardium and also will form the visceral layer of serous pericardium, which is called epicardium. And therefore, this outer layer is called epimyocardium because it forms the myocardium and the epicardium, which is visceral layer of serous pericardium. And also this figure shows clearly that this single heart tube is suspended to the roof of the pericardial cavity by a mesentery which is called dorsal mesocardium and this mesentery surely will disappear after development after later stages of development and the position of the dorsal mesocardium will be the so-called the transverse pericardial sinus one of the sinuses of the serous pericardium this is all about formation and position of the heart tube, of the endocardial heart tube. And this is the text with a magnified figure for these descriptions. The heart tube later on will enlarge more than the size of the pericardial cavity. Therefore, the heart tube will be folded in order to be inside the pericardial cavity. And as a result of this folding, there will be formation of the heart loop. First, we have heart tube, but later on, we will find that the tube is folded or bent inside the pericardial cavity to form the heart loop. Actually, the heart tube and heart loop shows four dilatations and thus the heart tube and heart loop are formed of four parts. These four parts are as following from anterior to posterior or from cephalic to caudal. The most anterior part of the heart tube, the dilatation in the heart tube is called bulbous cordis. More caudal to this, the dilatation of the heart tube is called ventricle. More caudal, the part of the heart tube called the atrium. And more caudal is the sinus, venosus, described here as the body, because the sinus venosus is formed of a transverse body and right and left horns of sinus venosus. All of this is sinus venosus. It is formed of a body and right and left horns. These four parts of the heart tube will give 
the following derivatives. We will start with derivatives of the bulbous cordis, the most anterior part of the heart tube. The bulbous cordis could be described in terms of derivatives as also being three parts. Proximal part, middle part, and distal part. The proximal part will form, or the proximal one-third, will form the trabeculated right ventricle that contain uh, trabeculi carrying muscles. The middle part of the bulbous cordis, or the middle third, is called conus cordis, and it will form the outflow of right ventricle and left ventricle, and in anatomy, the outflow of right ventricle is called infundibulum of right ventricle, while the outflow of the left ventricle is called vestibule of the left ventricle. The distal part or distal third of the bulbous cordis is called the truncus arteriosus because it will form the trunk of the uh, root of the aorta, which is ascending aorta, and also it will form the pulmonary trunk. So these are the three parts of the bulbous cordis from proximal to distal, which are uh, divided into one-third by one-third by one-third. The proximal one-third is right ventricle. The middle one-third is the conus cordis forming infundibulum and vestibule, uh, infundibulum of the right ventricle, vestibule of the left ventricle. And distal one-third called the truncus arteriosus, which will form the trunk of root of aorta, which is ascending aorta, and pulmonary trunk. Regarding derivatives of the second brain uh, uh, part of the uh, heart tube, which is the ventricle, this part will form the left ventricle, and of course it will be the trabeculated left ventricle that contains the trabeculi carrying. And you can see that the proximal one-third of bulbus form right ventricle, while, the, while all this ventricle will form the left ventricle. The common atrium of the heart tube, the third part, will later on divide into two and form trabeculated right atrium and left atrium that contains pectinate muscles, although they are called the trabeculated right uh, atria, but they contain muscles that are called pectinate muscles. The sinus venosus, as, as we said before a while, is formed of a body, transverse body, and right and left horn. And each horn receives three tributaries, which are vital line vein from the yolk sac, which is also called omphalomesentric vein, umbilical vein, and common cardinal vein that drains the body of the embryo. Of course, the umbilical vein uh, is connected with the placenta via the umbilical cord, while the cardinal vein, the common cardinal vein, it drains the body of the embryo by anterior and posterior divisions or cardinal veins. If you consider these parts of the heart tube, you can imagine comparing that uh, comparison of these parts of these parts of the heart tube with the anatomy of the heart. There must be here a septum between the right ventricle and left ventricle. Also, this part, the conus cordis, that will divide into vestibule and infundibulum, must show a septum that divides it into two, vestibule and infundibulum. Also, this part, the truncus arteriosus, must show a septum that divides the ascending aorta from pulmonary trunk. Even the atrium must show a septum to be divided into right atrium and left atrium. Therefore, the next topic will be septation of the heart, and we will start with septation of the atria. As you know, the atria first is a single atrium that will divide into right and left. So what's going on? That from the single atrium, there will be a septum that descends from the roof of the single atrium. This septum 
is called the primary septum or septum of primer. It will descend downward, dividing the common atrium, the single atrium, into right and left. When it will descend this primary septum, it will fuse with a tissue that is formed uh, between the atria and ventricles that are called arterioventricular cushions. So as you can see in the figure, the primary septum descends from the roof of the single atrium and fuses with the atrioventricular cushion which are tissues between the atria and ventricle. Therefore, this opening between the primary atrium and the cushion will be closed. This opening could be called as the primary ostium or ostium primum. So we can say that the ostium primum between the primary septum and the atrioventricular cushion is closed when the primary septum fuses with the atrioventricular cushion. But, because the lung is not functioning in the fetus and embryo, the blood in the right atrium must not pass to the right ventricle because the right ventricle is not in need to push blood to the lung. Therefore, the blood in the right atrium must keep on passing to the left atrium and from the left atrium to the left ventricle and then to the body of the embryo. Because of that, just before closure of the ostium primum between the primary septum and the cushion, there will be a formation of a new opening in the primary septum. Just before closure of the primary ostium, there will be a new ostium in the primary septum to keep blood flow from the right atrium to the left atrium. This opening, this new opening that occurs in the primary septum to maintain right to flow interatrial blood flow is called secondary opening or secondary ostium or ostium secundum. And thus, the secondary opening will maintain right atrial to left atrial blood flow during fetal life because the right atrium is not in need for pushing the blood to the right ventricle because the right ventricle is not pushing the blood to the lung in the embryo. You can see here that the primary septum fuses with the atrioventricular cushion and before effusion, a new opening, which is ostium secundum, develop. However, the postnatal heart must not contain such an ostium secundum between the right and left atria. After birth, this secondar, secondary ostium or secondary opening also must be closed in order to separate the atria completely after birth. Therefore, a new other septum grow from the roof of the atrium, actually from the roof of the right atrium, on the right side of the primary septum. This new septum is called secondary septum or septum secundum. It will descend also downward just like the primary septum, but it will not reach to the cushion. The secondary septum will descend for a small distance or a short distance only enough to close the secondary opening. Finally, you will find this secondary septum descending downward to cover only the secondary opening or the secondary ostium. The secondary septum will not extend deep to the cushion as just like the primary septum. And therefore, after birth, when the right atrium start to push blood to the right ventricle and the right ventricle pushes the blood to the lung after birth, the high pressure in the right atrium due to functioning pulmonary circulation will push the secondary septum to be fused with the primary septum and thus closing the secondary opening. 
Of course, this secondary opening is only by attachment in the first month or early after birth, early periods after birth. But this effusion will be completed by fibrosis at about three months. Therefore, some children may uh, show uh, signs of right to left shunt of blood in early period after birth because the fusion of the secondary septum and the primary septum is not by fibrous tissue after birth, immediately after birth. But uh, all what happens that after three months, this fusion of the secondary septum and primary septum will be completed. Of course, when the secondary opening is closed by the fusion of the secondary septum with the primary septum of birth, the secondary opening or the ostium secundum will be described in anatomy in the right atrium as fossa ovalis. The floor of fossa ovalis is the primary septum while the margins of the fossa ovalis, which are called, which is called limbus fossa ovalis, is formed by the secondary opening, uh, secondary septum. The floor is the primary septum, while the limbus, the margin, the limbus fossa ovalis is secondary septum. And therefore, some textbook describe the secondary opening or the ostium secundum in another name, which is foramen ovali, as uh, after birth, when this foramen ovale will be closed, it will form an anatomy fossa ovale. This is all about interatrial septation. Don't forget that in practice you may hear by stethoscope shunt of blood producing murmur from the right atrium to the uh, left atrium immediately after birth. So you don't have to tell the parents that the child had interatrial septal defect. Just wait for three months and look for this shunt of blood, the murmur. If it will disappear by uh, hearing of the stethoscope during examination, that's all. It means that uh, the secondary septum is not yet fibrosed with the primary septum. But if it will not disappear after three months, so tell the parent that the child had interatrial opening. Now we will talk about septation of the ventricles. Again, I have to go to the parts of the heart tube, to the figure. You remember that this ventricle part of the heart tube will form the left ventricle. This is the left ventricle. While the proximal one-third of bulbous cordis will form the right ventricle. So we need a septum here between the right ventricle and left ventricle. Septation of the ventricles occurs by the way shown in this figure. The medial walls of the ventricle will not grow, while the lateral walls of these ventricles will grow. And because of that, the medial walls of the right and left ventricle will oppose each other, forming a septum. Because the lateral walls glow, grow, as you can see in the figure, but the medial wall are not growing and opposing each other forming a septum but you can see also from the figure that this septum is not a complete septum it does not divide the cavity of the right and left ventricle completely there will be a defect above this septum this defect is closed by extension from the atrioventricular cushion this extension will be the membranous interventricular septum the membranous interventricular septum will fuse with the other part of the interventricular septum, which is the muscular interventricular septum. And you can imagine that this part, which is formed by opposition of the medial walls, will form the muscular interventricular septum. And what above this part, the defect, will be closed by membranous interventricular septum, which is extending from the atrioventricular cushion. This is all about ventricular septation. The atria and ventricles. 
surely must separate from each other. And we said that between the atria and the ventricle, we have four atrioventricular cushions. The atrioventricular cushion, as is shown in this figure, will grow toward each other and closing the atrioventricular orifices, forming right and left atrioventricular orifices. Each orifice is guarded by valve, therefore the cushions will fuse and form the orifices between the right and left, right and uh, atrium and the right ventricle, and the orifice between the left atrium and left ventricle, and also the cushion will form the valves, which are the mitral valve for the left atrioventricular orifice, and the tricuspid valve for the right atrioventricular orifice. All of them are from the growth of the atrioventricular cushions, which are four cushions. Septation in the truncus arteriosus and conus cordis. And I just want to go to the back, to the figure uh, of, the, of these parts in the heart tube. The middle one-third of the bulbous cordis is called conus cordis. That will need a septum dividing it into infundibulum of the right ventricle and vestibule of the aorta. And the distal one-third of the bulbous cord is called the truncus arteriosus that needs a septum to, to divide it into root of ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. So we need a septum here and a septum here. And the conus cordis and the truncus arteriosus. So the title is conotruncal septation. Septation of the conus cordis and the truncus arteriosus. Actually, in these two parts, the conus cordis and truncus arteriosus, there will be a growth of bilateral swellings. We have conal bilateral swellings and the truncal bilateral swellings. And these bilateral swellings will grow toward each other, but in a spiral way, as you can see in this figure. They are growing, this, right, the bilateral truncal swellings and bilateral conal swelling will grow toward each other, but in a spiral way to divide the truncus arteriosus into the infundibulum and vestibule, and dividing the, uh, the, uh, to divide the conus cordis into uh, infundibulum and vestibule, and divide the conus, uh, the truncus arteriosus into uh, ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. And you can imagine, in anatomy, the pulmonary trunk is spiraling on the aorta, this spiraling uh, seen in anatomy is due to spiral growth of the conotruncal septation. Such a complicated development of the heart must be associated logically with many anomalies. And actually in a practice when you will find uh, a suspicion of an anomaly from a clinical examination in a newborn or even in an adult, you will have to go to the imaging technique or the catheterization to diagnose the specific type of the anomaly. But for academic purposes and also to have a knowledge, uh, basic knowledge about the clinical practice, there are some anomalies that or abnormalities in the cardiac development that I want to enumerate. In your text, uh, Langman of Embryology, there are much description for these anomalies, but uh, I think that such a description that I will make is enough for you in a matter of enumeration. Starting with description of the interarterial septum abnormality. Simply, the ostium secundum may be so large that it will remain open and thus there will be an uh, open ostium secundum or open foramen ovale between the right and left atrium or the ostium primum will remain open you know the ostium primum is between the septum primer and the cushion the fusion of the cushion with the septum primer will not occur or there will be no septum in the atria at all you will find two ventricles and one atrium so triloculari three locules, two of them are ventricles, biventriculari, triloculari, 
two of them biventriculari with no septum formation vitreo. Or we suppose that the foramen ovale, the secondary opening, will be closed after birth. If it is closed before birth, it will lead to premature closure of foramen ovale that leads to abnormality associated mostly with death of the newborn shortly after birth. These are examples of sept interarterial septal defect. Examples of uh, defect in the trancoconal septation, the spiral septation. One of them is most common in, in Iraq. It is called tetralogy of follow. Tetra means four. There is an abnormality which is formed of four uh, configurations described by a scientist called fallot. So it is tetralogy of fallot. The four abnormalities are narrowing of the infundibulum of right ventricle, infundibular stenosis, plus defect in the, in the interventricular septum, plus the aorta is over the defect of interventricular septum defect, so it is called overriding the aorta. The aorta must be over the uh, left ventricle here, it is not over the left ventricle, it is over the interventricular septum and specifically it is over the defect in the interventricular septum. And finally, hypertrophied right ventricle. Such an abnormality, which is tetralogy of fallout, uh, will result in a newborn which uh, have a blue skin, blue mucosa, because uh, the oxygenated blood is mixed with the deoxygenated blood, so it is considered as a cyanotic congenital heart disease of the newborn, because the newborn will become blue, cyanotic. Other example of abnormality of a trunchoconal spiral septation is that there will be no spiral septation at all, so there will be a persistent truncus arteriosus. The uh, truncus arteriosus is open, and you have... Uh, uh, one big vessel which is uh, dividing into pulmonary arteries and aorta. Or there will be no spiral growth. The growth of the trunchoconal septum occur normally but not in a spiral way. So you have transposition of, gra of great vessels. The aorta will originate from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery originates from the left ventricle. Or there will be stenosis of the aortic semilunar valve of pulmonary semilunar valve because simply the truncus arteriosus swellings the swelling of the truncus arteriosus is or are the swelling that form the pulmonary valve and aortic valve therefore abnormality in the truncus arteriosus swellings that will form spiral growth if there is an abnormality in the truncal swellings there will be maybe a stenosis of the aortic valve or pulmonary valve because these pulmonary and aortic valves are derived from the truncal swellings. Example of abnormalities of the interventricular septum is that there will be no interventricular septum partial or complete or there may be a persistent arterioventricular canal because the cushion is not formed and you know uh, the, one of the cushions give the membranous interventricular septum Therefore, persistent atrioventricular canal is associated with absence of uh, membranous interventricular septum. Apart from these anomalies that are examples of the anomalies, there are many much more anomalies that could be described with figure and dynamic. I don't want to pass into these. There is uh, an abnormality which is... Uh, also seen in practice that the heart is on the right side, not in the, on the left side. And this is called dextrocardia. Many times uh, you are examining as a new doctor, resident doctor in the hospital, putting the stethoscope on the left side of the chest. You will not hear the, sound, uh, the sounds of the heart and you will be surprised. And when you look around, you will find that the heart is on the right side. Then the patient will love telling you that I'm having dextrocardia. So beware always, also, all, always with dextrocardia, uh, heart on the right side. This dextrocardia may be the only anomaly, anomaly or it will be associated with the uh, transposition of abdominal viscera, which is called the situs inversus. Uh, 
in which you will have the liver on the left, the spleen on the right, and so on. Some newborn will have absent sternum, absence of anterior thoracic wall, and the heart could be seen on the surface of the newborn. This condition is called ectopia cordis, and it may be corrected surgically. That's all about uh, embryology of the uh, cardiac system and part of the embryology of the cardiovascular system. Thank you very much.